I'm Ryan Cox, I'm with Creation Truth Foundation, and it is a tremendous blessing to get to be here with all of you and learn a little something about dinosaurs. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to be perusing the information about dinosaurs within the context of worldview, your worldview. Did anybody here learn anything about worldview this morning? All right, I would certainly hope so. And for those of you who weren't here, a worldview is a set of beliefs that is based on a foundation of truth that we use to view and guide our lives. Everything you see in the world, you're looking at it through the lenses of your worldview. And everything that you've experienced in life affects that worldview. And here's what it boils down to. Your worldview, when you're analyzing anything and everything, people, places, events, politics, procedures, dinosaurs, science, whatever it may be, it's either going to be one of two worldviews. It's either going to be a biblical worldview or a non-biblical worldview. Guess what I need to constantly be studying then? Because even though I've studied it my whole life, been, a, been in the church, raised church, church, guess what? I find every now and then something in my life wasn't quite aligned with God's word. And that's why I keep studying. I keep learning. I, wow, that's amazing. The truths that constantly be one of the incredible testimonies of the inspiration of this book is can anyone exhaust its wisdom? I mean, the person who's lived 100 years, read the Bible cover to cover every year of their life, guess what happens in their 101st year when they go to read it? Well, there's something there I'd never seen before. As if we thought we could exhaust the wisdom of our Creator God. It's just a powerful thing. So, dinosaurs within a biblical worldview. What would the biblical worldview be of dinosaurs? Here's what we're going to break it down into, and over the next four nights, we're going to examine each of these points regarding a biblical worldview of dinosaurs. First of all, their creation, recorded in the first chapter of the book, the greatest history book ever given to us. Secondly, what happened during the greatest global catastrophe our world ever experienced, the global flood. How did the dinosaurs fit in with that? And then thirdly, after the flood, what happened with the dinosaurs? Were, did they, were they on the ark? Did they survive it? If so, were they in history? Did people see them? What happened to them? All those types of things we're going to examine over the next four nights. So uh, if there's any night to miss, I don't know what it is. So you need to be here every night, all right? That's the, my best advice for that. It's going to be a lot of fun, a lot of excitement. And so let's start in with dinosaurs and their creation and what they are. Because here's something that you might not even realize. Can you answer the question as to what is a dinosaur? Who here can tell me what a dinosaur is? All right, what's a dinosaur? It's what? It's an animal, okay? Any specific category of animals? Lizard, okay, what would a lizard be classified as? Reptiles, okay, so we got reptiles. Reptiles, what are some characteristics about reptiles? They are scaly, they got scales. Cold-blooded, endothermic, I'm sorry, ectothermic. And they breathe oxygen through nostrils. They have a heart, they have lungs pumping, all that kind of stuff, okay. So, reptiles, name me some reptiles. Snakes. Turtles, alligators, chameleons, crocodiles, Komodo dragons, bearded lizard, okay, all those go on and on, right? Now, here is the deal then. Dinosaurs are reptiles, right? So are all reptiles dinosaurs? Is a crocodile a dinosaur? I mean, it, it, no, it's not. So why then do these guys get their own classification? Because they're cool. Well, they kind of, okay. What makes a dinosaur a dinosaur? All right. Now, if we were in VBS, I'd have all the kids stand up, and here's what we do, okay. Stick out your arms like this. All right, you don't have to stand up, okay. How does a gator walk? Kind of like that, right, okay. Lizard? Same kind of thing, okay. Komodo dragon. Turtles? They're all the same thing, okay. Not so with dinosaurs. What makes a dinosaur a dinosaur is the special way their hips and legs are arranged. 
Dinosaurs are reptiles that walk upright on their legs. So everybody stand up. I am going to do this with you. This is what we do in VBS and, and okay, for all the school programs or anything. All right. So repeat after me. A dinosaur is, a, dinosaur is. a reptile that walks. Now take your hands and put them right here. Upright on its legs. Sit back down. Very good. See, you're already learning something. This is good. Dinosaurs have a special part about their neck. Check it out over here. This is our Albertosaurus. His name is Pebbles. Everybody say hi, Pebbles. Hi, Pebbles. Gee, you guys are good. This is just like, all right. Notice his arrangement of his bipedal gait here. His leg goes straight up, and at the top of the femur, it makes a right turn. It goes right in. There's a little hole in the hip, the acetabulum, and right in there causes him to walk upright on his legs. Now, some of you are like, but wait a minute, what about the four-legged ones? Take a look. This is our triceratops. His name is Gundy. Everybody say hi, Gundy. Gundy, look at the rear legs. This is the case for all four-legged dinosaurs. The legs go straight up, make the right turn, go right into the open hole, and so they are walking upright on their legs. That's what gets dinosaurs their own classification. That is very important. For the things we're going to learn about, especially Wednesday night. That's going to come in huge on Wednesday night. And you'll find out why on Wednesday night. So there you go. Within this, you have two different hip structures. These guys are great examples of it. Okay, You have the sorisian. That's the fancy word. It means lizard-hipped. All right, This guy over here would be in that category. The other category would be ornithischian bird-hipped. And... Gundy would fit within that category. They just, when they were first discovering, they noticed a, uh, there was this consistent pattern of two different types of hip, stru hip structures. And so they gave him those, those kinds of names. They're like, that one's kind of more like a bird. It's not really like a bird, but it's a lot more like it. And this one is definitely more lizard-like, so we're going to go with that for that category on that one. And so that's how they, they come. What I need you to know tonight, because you're like, that's great. I don't need all dinosaur anatomy. What you need to know tonight is a particular one in which classification it is, okay? Within the Sauriscian group, on this side, we have the theropods. Everybody say theropod. Theropod, big legs, little arms. You know those. Name me a theropod. T-Rex, yes, absolutely. What else? Raptors, okay, absolutely. So our dromaeosaur right here, would be, that's the raptor kind, all right? All raptors are in the dromaeosaur family. This is dromaeosaurus. Um, pebbles over there. T-Rex, they're all in that class. That's the one I need you to remember. Okay, Keep that right up here. The theropods have which kind of hips? Lizard hips. Okay, So which kind of hips do the theropods have? Lizard hips. That's the one I need you to remember. Okay, The rest of them, just so you know, also on that side, the sauropods. Everybody say sauropod. That's the long neck, long tail ones. On the other side, on the Ornithischians, you have the Thyrophora. That's any of them that have an armor or plate. So Stegosaurus and Kylosaurus, those. You have the Ornithopods, Hadrosaurs, um, Parasaurolophus, at our um, Edmontosaurus here. He's in that category. You have the Pachycephalosauria. So our Pachys, all right, all those, the dome-headed ones usually, they're in that category. And also over there are the Ceratopsians, so like Gundy, okay? But the ones I need you to remember are the theropods, and they have which kind of hips? Lizard hips. Very good. Now then, within each of these categories, they all can get really, really big, but they can also be really, really small. There are big ones, small ones. You can finish the song. And so they have an average size if you take the biggest to the smallest as an adult size, they average out to about the size of your today American bison, okay, about the size of buffalo. That's the average size of all the adults. And figuring out their sizes, that's an important thing. And that's going to come into play on Tuesday night, I believe. Is that right, Matt? Okay, Tuesday night. That's going to be really important. So we're going to come back to that, all right? Now then. Let's take a look here. These creatures, dinosaurs, are what? Reptiles that walk upright on their legs. That was pretty pitiful. Okay. 
So repeat after me. A dinosaur is a reptile that walks upright on its legs. Very good, okay? That's the important thing. So let me ask you a question here. This guy right here. This is the uh, Tylosaurus. Name is Bunker. Everybody say hi, Bunker. Okay. Uh-oh, I lost my presentation. Can you restart me there on that slide I was on? Very good. This is the one that has the earth on it, the globe. All right. Is Bunker a dinosaur? What does Bunker have for his means of locomotion? Flippers. That's right. So is he a dinosaur? Can he walk upright on his legs? No, he cannot. So he is not a dinosaur. His special category classification would be marine reptile. Okay? So, not a dinosaur. What about this guy up here? That's a pteranodon. Okay? The pterosaurs, pterodactyls are a little smaller, about 3 to 5 feet in wingspan. These guys get 11 to 22 feet in wingspan. This is pretty big. Is that a dinosaur? Does he, for his mode of locomotion, walk upright on his legs? No. What does he do? He, he flies. Exactly. So he is technically not a dinosaur. He would be classified as flying reptile. That's his scientific classification, flying reptile. Yes, all right. So, not, so here's the thing. The Bible gives us some details about which kinds of animals were created and when they were created on which particular days of the first week of history. Winged and water creatures were created on what number day of history? Anybody know? Five. Land creatures created on day number six. You were asked a question this morning. Now let your worldview do the thinking here of what we just know from the Bible. Which came first, the chicken or the dinosaur in a biblical worldview? The chicken kind. All your winged creatures, day five. Land creatures, day number six. That's important to remember, especially in the context of worldview. And what is trying to be taught today regarding these creatures? So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and on that sixth day of history, can you push the button there for it to advance, and then I think I'll be good. There we go. Very good. On the sixth day of history, we read, there it is, then God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle and creeping things, and beasts of the earth after their kind, and it was so. The words used there are phenomenal. The word for cattle there is actually the word behemoth, means the biggest, largest, most gargantuan. And then it says the creeping things, the idiot's bittiest, and the word beast is the word nephesh, means everything in between. Anything that has the breath of life. So from the biggest to the smallest and everything in between, would that leave anything out? Don't you love your Bible? How inclusive it is? Gets it all in there. So then, what would that include? By definition, that would include dinosaurs. Exactly. So we got to look at the dinosaurs and me. Because here's the deal. Everywhere we go, Matt and I, when we go places, church camps and BBSs, guess what we find is like the number one educator of young people regarding dinosaurs? Jurassic Park, number one, number two, dinosaur train. You got dinosaur ranch. You got, dino, you got all these things, okay? The media and then the accompanying books that go with that are teaching our young people about dinosaurs, and the vast majority of the time, it is not within a biblical worldview. It's within a secular evolutionary worldview. What does the actual science regarding these creatures support? So we got to understand what is being portrayed in the movies, okay? So let's start at the top. What is the biggest, baddest, scariest dinosaur ever portrayed in the media? There is. Hide the children. Careful, get ready. Here it comes. Brace yourselves.
I'm sorry you had to see that. All right. T-Rex often gets described as the biggest scariest. How accurate is, T is T Rex portrayed in the movies? Let's take a look. Listen to the details. Well, we clocked the T Rex to 32 miles an hour. How fast? 32. T, -T Rex? Mm hmm. You said you've got a T Rex? Uh huh. Say again. <laughs> we have a T Rex. Wow. This is my favorite one. I love T-Rex. T-Rex, mostly because of how he was portrayed in the movies. This is the most ferocious predator, apex predator that ever walked planet Earth. He is a relentless hunter. He will sniff you out. He knows exactly where his prey is. His, his vision is, is, is unmatched. He can see you in the day or the night. He has this incredibly lightning fast speed. And as he hunts you down, no matter how hard you try to escape, he will not give up until he has had his meal and all the leftovers because this predator is so voracious. He has to eat and he has to eat now. And you have no chance of possibly escaping unless you just happen to have a Jeep Wrangler. <laughs> then you're good. How accurate is any of that? Let's take a look. So... T-Rex, named by Henry Fairfield Osborne, means the tyrant lizard king, because this was, about, this was the most impressive creature that had been unearthed at that time. He was so impressive, great magnitude, um, and then later on in 89, they realized those dinky little arms actually go to that thing, and the tyrant lizard king, come to find out, can't even scratch his own nose, but you know, that's beside the point. So you have pictured here Sue. Matt mentioned Sue uh, this morning. Sue is considered to be the largest T-Rex to date. Uh, there's one in the competition with it named Scotty. There's debate about that right now. But the other one that we have is, I want to introduce you to Stan. This is Stan the T-Rex. Everybody say hi, Stan. This is Stan. Stan is very, very cool. Uh, Stan was at the Black Hills Institute of South Dakota. Uh, he was discovered in 1987. He was just put up for auction uh, 2020, October 2020, sold for $31.8 million. That's his full skeleton there. And we have absolutely no idea where he went. Purchased by an anonymous bidder. The reason that is a big deal is because when Stan was discovered in 1987 by Stan Sackerson, this was the most complete intact T-Rex skull ever found. And to date, my understanding is, still is the most intact, complete T-Rex skull. See, when they found Sue, Sue was 90% complete, but her head was under her pelvis completely crushed. What kind of a catastrophe could have done that to the largest T-Rex that ever walked the planet? You might want to come back tomorrow night. Stan's head, though, even though he was only 65% complete, his entire head was 100% complete. And perfectly disarticulated, as in each bone was nice and separated and intact. None of it was crushed. This was the find of the 20th century in paleontology, my opinion. They were able to reconstruct Stan's head, and we learned more about T-Rexes from this head than any other. Now, the number one question we always get, when, when, especially young people, when they walk in is, Are those real? Yes. Nothing you see up here is fake. No holograms, nothing like that. Everything is real. You can, cut, you can touch it with your own hand. Don't touch any. Don't touch. Okay. But if you were to ask, though, is it real or a replica, that's a, di that's a totally different question. The answer to that is depends on which one you're talking about. Some of these are the actual rock fossils dug up out of the ground. We're going to talk about them throughout the week. Some of them, though, are research-level replicas cast from the actual fossil. When they dug up Stan, guess what? Every museum and university want to get their hands on. Stan. They wanted to see Stan. Fossils are pretty much solid rock. How heavy do you think this thing is? This one isn't solid rock, and it takes three guys to, put him, to, to pick him up. You need a forklift if this was the actual rock fossil. Not to mention rock. How easy is that to ship around? Now, what's going to happen? It's going to crack. Yeah, so no, you can't do that. Yet every museum wants 
dinosaur fossils. Every university wants them. Everybody wants to study them. So what they do is they make a research-level replica from the actual one. They're guys, this is their profession. And that's what you see here. This is an actual, this was cast from Stan. To such detail, every little nook, cranny, crack, wrinkle, everything is exactly as it is on the real Stan. You can do actual scientific research on this. And that's how we study and we learn about it. And so they make these replicas. There aren't very many of them in the world. He's, he is the most researched one, the most mass-produced one. At the time, of uh, my understanding, when, we, when the ministry came to possess this, there were only 30 of these in the world. This is one of them. Now, my last count, I saw there were about 60 or 70 of them in the world, of the actual one-to-one -one scale of them. So Stan's a pretty cool deal, all right? And, and feel free to come up and get your picture of Stan later on. It's really neat. So what did we learn? about T-Rexes? Well, for one, we, what do we already know? What do we already know? Big sharp teeth means he's what? Meat eater, 100%, right? Meat eater, because sharp teeth always means meat eater, right? I was it? No? What has sharp teeth and doesn't eat meat? What? Oh, panda bears, yeah, that's right, they don't eat meat. Fruit bats, oh yeah, that's right, they don't eat meat. They got really sharp teeth, though. The sharp teeth automatically mean meat eater. That's, that's a usually an assumption you jump to, but you got to verify that. Remember, the scientific method is observe, test, repeat, falsify. What can we observe in the data that would tell us if it is a meat eater or not? And you're like, well, what's the big deal? It's not, really, unless you are adamant that there's no way he could survive without meat then it kind of becomes an issue. You see, in, is it possible for an animal to live without meat? The tigers at the Oklahoma City Zoo get watermelon for their birthday. This is a picture of one of them. And they love it. They love it. They love the juices everywhere. They first play with it like, you know, like a mouse, with, and, and, and then they just devour it. And they think it's great. Like, this is so weird, right? Okay. There's a worldview issue here. See, millions of years, billions of years, has a major conflict with God's word. When Adam and Eve sinned, what's the consequence? For the wages of sin is, Romans 6.23. Is it or is it not? See, if you try to take the evolutionary worldview of millions and millions of years of these creatures eating one another, death, disease, destruction, pain, and suffering, and then you try to say, well, I want to believe the Bible as well, and so you have Adam and Eve, they come in, they eat the fruit, they sin, and what changed? Death was already here, pain, suffering, disease, turmoil, chaos, pain, it's already here, what changed? I mean... It was just spiritual death, just spiritual death. Well, that totally doesn't hold up when you read the text. Also, if it was just spiritual death, then why did Jesus have to physically die and physically rise from the dead? Why does it say in Corinthians 15 over and over and over again that death is the enemy and it needs to be defeated? And it says that in the context of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That wasn't a spiritual resurrection, that was a physical one. Okay, so you, you got a major worldview. So... In God's word, Genesis chapter 1, you get to verse 30, and it says that what did everything in perfection in the garden eat? What did they eat? Vegetation. So if T-Rex was in the garden of Eden, the Tyrannosaur kind, what would they have eaten? They would have eaten fruits, vegetables, okay. That, they're like, well, that can't happen, that's not right. There's this creature named Little Tyke. Little Tyke was born in the 1950s in the New York City Zoo. It was rescued from its mother. Could not, uh, they, they had to rescue it because the mother had killed all of its other cubs. And so when they rescued it, they then gave it to George and Margaret Westbow of Upper New York. The name of their ranch, uh, their place where they kept some of these exotic animals to help them, I kid you not, was called Hidden Valley Ranch. <laughs> now make it up. Little Tyke, though, they tried, when they tried to wean it from the milk, they couldn't get it to eat any meat. It just would refuse it. They would even try to put little droplets of blood in the milk, and it would spit it out. 
They would puree meat, try to put it in with grains and, and uh, fruits and stuff, spit it out every time, couldn't stand it. They became kind of concerned about it, put out a $1,000 reward if anybody come up with a way to help little tyke learn to eat meat. Well, they have a field trip of young people coming through one day, and they bring them to Little Tyke, and they tell them the story about Little Tyke, and they can't get it to eat. And one of these little kids, I, I know why I won't eat meat. And they're like, oh, uh, why is that? And he said, because in Genesis, the Garden of Eden, all the animals ate plants. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> Went and looked it up. Well, if the Lord designed them with the ability to live without meat then maybe little tyke will be okay and they never really worried about it after that and little tyke grew up the veterinarians who would come and examine little tyke said it was one of the healthiest lionesses they ever saw beautiful coat very healthy i mean what's a dog do when it gets sick eats grass okay so could they have survived without meat yes okay it's not a problem unless you have a worldview issue with that science says it's not a problem worldview is where that comes into a conflict. What does the actual scientific evidence show? It shows that at some point they did begin to eat meat. So you see my Edmontosaurus over there. They found a vertebrae in one. Um, I think it was around 2014, give or take, something like that. And um, a, a backbone. And inside of it was a T-Rex tooth. And it was healed over. So the T-Rex had bitten that Edmontosaurus. It got away, and it ripped out one of his teeth when it was at it. And you see, that's one of the other things. Did they eat, were they hunters or were they scavengers? You see, the bigger the tooth gets, the less anchored it is in there, and so they can come out easier. So they can't put up a really big fight for a long time, otherwise they're going to lose all their teeth, okay, except for the ones that are still smaller and anchored in. But like a good reptile, like a good what? Reptile. They keep growing their teeth in. You come up here and look, you'll find little baby ones growing in here. It's pretty cool, right? So they got it. Their teeth also very short. See, I'll always have somebody come up to me at a camp, it seems like, and they'll say, well, Gorgosaurus is bigger. Spinosaurus, it took it out in the third movie. Who saw the third movie? Yeah, you won't do that again, will you? That was an awful movie. All right. Third, it, Spinosaurus, it, eh, I'm sorry. Hang on a second. When they take these guys and they put them into the computer models, there are these little holes here called windows. The fancy term is fenestra. They put that into the models, uh, computer models, and they can simulate what they think the bite force is. Okay? Now, it's, it's a model. It's an idea based on the evidence. And guess what turns out to be true for T-Rex? Strongest bite force of any land animal to walk planet Earth. So strong, up to 12,800 PSI on one of these teeth. These teeth are not necessarily for, uh, good for serrating, for slicing through. They are for crushing to the point where if he gets a bite on that Spinosaurus, he's going to crush the bone to the point he could just suck out his bone marrow and eat him right there. That's why I like T-Rex. I'm just saying. That, that's spiritual right there. That's why you came to church. So... So there you go. That's a T-Rex tooth. That's a research replica. That's why I can pass that one around. If it was the real one, it would be under lock and key. They are expensive, the real one. So there you go. You can check out a T-Rex tooth. 12,800 pounds. Land creature. Land creature. There are other things that have a stronger bite force than T-Rex. Got to come back Wednesday night. Wednesday night is going to be good. All right. So T-Rex, how fast could he run in the movie? 32 mile an hour. Is that real? At the time... That movie comes out in 1993, 1988 was the most recent one, 31 mile an hour on Jurassic Park. Ours is going to be faster, so it's 32. Since then, learned a lot more about dinosaur anatomy, especially of T-Rexes, and the latest studies say anywhere from about 11 mile an hour to maybe a spurt of 17 mile an hour. That's still pretty, it's still hauling pretty good, okay? He doesn't want to go much bit faster than that, though, because this guy weighs a lot. We're talking several tons here. 10, 15 tons, whatever. I mean, it, it, what happens if he trips? <laughs> Seriously, he will cause internal organ, internal damage, injuries. He does not want that to happen. So he is not, and it's going to take a lot of energy and everything to try to hunt something down. So he's going to go after something that's slower than him or as big as he is. He's got to supplement his diet. He might do some scavenging as well. What does he have here? 
huge nose. He could smell stuff out probably from a good long distance, okay? So don't worry. If he comes to life, it's all right. I heard it. Yeah, so, all right, so no. Here's the thing, though. They need these theropods. Remember the theropods? What kind of hips do they have? <clears throat> I know you're watching the game, but you got to answer the questions, okay? All right. By the way, how are we doing? No, 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 no. Okay. What kind of hips do theropods have? Lizard hips, all right. So there is a story that's being told with theropods. And they got to have them be fast runners because of the story they're telling. So even though that's the science behind it, they're not fast runners. If you go to the St. Louis Science Center, this is the sign on display. Every time I've been there, it's still on display for years after we've known this. It says at least 20 feet tall, which that right there, there's a problem. Sue's the biggest. She's only 14 feet tall. So I don't know where they got 20. I have no clue where they got 20. And weighing up to 15 tons, Tyrannosaurus rex was the largest flesh-eating animal ever to walk the land. The dinosaur possessed massive jaws around, armed with seven-inch knife-like teeth. Its bite, which they're not really that good. But anyway, its bite could leave a three-foot wide hole in its prey. Tyrannosaurus was a swift and savage hunter, capable of speeds up to 40 miles an hour. As fast as a modern thoroughbred horse put that thing in the Kentucky Derby. Good night. No science behind that at all. That's the sign on display for T-Rex at the St. Louis Science Center. There's a story they're trying to tell with these creatures. Neat. What do we have here? The raptors. Oh, yeah, the raptors. They are, oh, my goodness. They hunt in packs. They're incredibly intelligent. They're problem-solving. They're the nastiest little things, aren't they? Except they're like, gigantic in the movies. Is any of that based on the science of what we actually know about raptors? Well, for one, remember these are theropods. And the theropods have what kind of hips? What kind? Lizard hip. Very good. There is a story that is being promoted by these more than any other as trying to pull people away from a biblical worldview into an evolutionary worldview. You just saw part of it right there in that clip. What's the raptor do when it gets up to the glass? Snorts on it. <laughs> Steams it up. It's what? It's supposed to be cold-blooded. Reptiles are cold-blooded. They're ectothermic. They don't have the ability to generate the heat inside of them. Therefore, can they fog up windows? No. Yet they did in the movie. Well, that's just for movie special effects. That's for the fun of it. Actually, it's not. In the Jurassic Park movies, the very first video clip I showed you, when Dr. Grant walks up, to the Brachiosaurus, he says, it's not it was all wrong. This is a warm-bodied creature. Did anybody hear that? It's the first thing I was about. This is a warm-bodied creature. In all the movies, guess what they teach? Dinosaurs were warm-blooded. Why? For one, it, there's science to that, right? Yeah, there's science to if something's warm-blooded or not. One of those things is nasal terminus. You have these little bony cartilage things in your nose that for you and I, it's a good thing we have them there because we are warm-blooded. The air is being heated up in there, and when we exhale through that, those things serve to catch moisture that would go out. If we didn't have them there over time, you and I would dehydrate ourselves. Aren't you glad the Lord put those there? An amazing design. Wait a minute. What then, if dinosaurs are warm-blooded, should we find? The nasal terminates. Look at what I have right here. I have a theropod dinosaur. The most complete one ever found. I can take a look. I can stick my head right here in his nose, which that's a fun thought in itself. <laughs> Guess what I find missing? Nasal terminates. Guess what's never been found in any dinosaur? 
nasal turbinates. So then why would we think that it was warm-blooded? Well, because we have a worldview that's demanding they be that. Why? Science doesn't support it. What's the worldview? There's this guy named Jack Horner, paleontologist, phenomenal paleontologist. Uh, when you read his life story, the guy overcame a lot of obstacles in life to achieve the great success. He, in fact, he's one of the guys I like to go to and see what is he teaching about a dinosaur, what is her, his thoughts, because he is very, very good. Montana State University is where he was at, and um, he's the guy tapped by Steven Spielberg to help do the Jurassic Park movies. His worldview of dinosaurs is what became dominant in the movie, and it was an idea that had already been around since the 70s, but Jurassic Park is what really released it to the masses, and it's become the dominant teaching today in all of academia. Listen to what they're teaching about this in Jurassic Park. We have discovered that dinosaur DNA and all di DNA just breaks down too fast. We're just not going to be able to do what they did in Jurassic Park. We're not going to be able to make a dinosaur based on a dinosaur. But birds are dinosaurs. Birds are living dinosaurs. We actually classify them as dinosaurs. We now call them non-avian dinosaurs and avian dinosaurs. So the non-avian dinosaurs are the big clunky ones that went extinct. Avian dinosaurs are our modern birds. Being evolutionized, you don't even realize it. So what is the scientific evidence behind this? We already know they're not warm-blooded. There's nothing to support that. Secondly, this isn't even a velociraptor. I am so sorry if I am ruining your childhood favorite movie, but I'm so here to tell you a velociraptor is no taller than my knee. About the size of a turkey. Velociraptors are this tall. That's it. Yeah, I know. You have to get up to see it, don't you? That tall. That's all the taller they are. What they're showing you is the depiction of a Deinonychus the size of a Utah raptor. They're like, well, why didn't they just call it a Utah raptor? Well, they said every time they were like, well, the Utah raptors are coming. They're like, oh, what channel are they playing on? I thought it was a basketball team. Well, that doesn't work. We've got to use Velociraptor, okay? So they use Velociraptor. Here's another thing you've got to see. If I were to ask you right now, show me your best dinosaur. Show me your best dinosaur. Young people, show me what a dinosaur looks like. Show me what a dinosaur. Yeah, you're all like this, right? Like this. That's what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're being evolutionized. Look at the picture up there. How are all their hands? They're all like this. Every time. Almost every time. Now you're being evolutionized. They are being portrayed like that when the anatomy says the absolute opposite. One of the rules, supposedly rules, in paleontology, uh, according to Dr. David Hone, is that theropods are clappers, not slappers. Okay, everybody do that with me. Theropods are not. Okay, and there's a reason why. There is, everybody's always like, what are those little arms for, right? Those puny little arms. What is that all about? For one, it's a balance issue. If these arms get much bigger, that's going to throw off the weight on the front half, and that tail won't be able to balance it. That's what that tail is for, why it's as long as it is. Beautifully balanced, like it was designed that way. Okay. But secondly, not only is it weight saving, there's an incredible mechanical property to this. Okay? I had my uncle who works in, in uh, physical therapy look at some of the uh, scientific papers on this and it's like, okay, explain this to me because I'm not a medical guy, right? And he said, this is incredible. I was like, what is it? Tell me, tell me, tell me. He said, here's the, here's the deal about these. These arms are incredibly strong, very strong. And it's because of the mechanical design to it. Not, not because of muscle, just because of the, of, the, of, how, of the design of it. This part of the arm, called the ulna, is anchored right here in the middle of the humerus. Okay? Your arm bone. You and I, our, our ulna and radius are not like that. But because of how it is, and then the radius is over here on this side, it cannot turn its hands over. It cannot pronate, and it cannot supinate. So can they open doors in the movies? No, no okay? Can't do that. The reason is because it can't, the way it's anchored there, it can't turn his hands there. 
Here's what it can do, though. Everybody take your hands. Put your palms together flat. Okay? Do not pull them apart. Keep them together. And how far can you pull your fingers back? Keep the palms together. Keep the palms together. Okay? How far can you bring your fingers back? Mm, about, about that far. Okay? All right? Theropods, these guys, their fingers can come back this far. Here's what happens. Here's what they think based on the evidence. Again, we keep studying, we keep learning. The big toe, the big toe, the sickle, the kill claw is what it's called. You can see it up there in the pictures. All right, you always see them tapping it on the tip. These are for puncturing and anchoring. They're not for slashing. They don't do that. The idea is they would jump on them with the feet, puncture that in there. Now they're anchored on the, on the animal they're trying to kill. These, however, are for slicing. And here's what happens. When he extends the arm, mechanically, it pushes the fingers out like this. And when he retracts, it brings them in, and you are locked in that grip. Not even with any muscle, you are locked in because of the mechanics of it. And so what the idea is, they would jump on their puncture, and then this motion is so strong, they just slice and dice at that. It's like the little dino hibachi girl. <laughs> and they just slice that thing, and, and they... Slash and dash, and that thing's going to bleed to death, and then they have a nice meal. They're incredible, incredible design, okay? That, so this is a, a mock-up of a Utah raptor, the big one, okay? Uh, sickle claw, uh, kill claw. There you go. You pass that around. Incredible design. Can they turn their wrists? Why then do they do that in movies? Because it's cool, so they can open doors? No. You go to uh, Sam Noble Museum in Oklahoma. And you look at what they teach about dromaeosaurs. Look at what they have it placed right beside. Bird. And they say, look at how similar its anatomy is. You actually look closely at it. They look nothing alike. For one, look at how they have it standing. Is that how theropods walk? Look at pebbles. Look at the dromy. No, they don't. They have it doing that, so it looks like what's it going to do someday? Fly. Yeah, that, that's not. We have a couple, several raptors. I mean, you look at them, that's not, what they, that's not what they look like. But the sign goes a step further, and this is just, oh, I couldn't believe this. Look at this one. They have modified wrist bones that allow dromaeosaurs to fold their hands against the body when running and allows birds to fold their wings. So look at what they have there. From what I can tell in the picture, they have the radius clear on the other side so that it can turn its hand. When I talked to my uncle about that, he said the only way that would be possible is if they have some very special cartilage there, and, and from all the papers, it's never been found. And even then, the, uh, the bone is not going to let them do that. But they have to have them do this so that one day they can tuck them in as wings... And later fly. Does the science support any of that? No. Yet look at the toys that you get all the time. And then this is what really leads us into this. Let's see here. My toy bag here. I don't go anywhere without my toys. So this was the first one that I saw years ago. I used to get these at Atwoods or Rural Kings or whatever, you know, and other places like that. Okay. Good, good raptor there. Okay. All right. Look real closely. What's there on the arm? Feathers. Feathers. Just little. But they're scaly and the same color as the rest of the body, so you wouldn't notice it. It took me three or four times until I realized, seeing it in the store, I got this one out of Walmart, and I was like, oh my, that has feathers on it, right there on his arms. Look at that. That's, that's crazy. How does that? Then... This one came out. Same creature. Supposed to be a raptor. Look at that. Fully covered in feathers. Hands are right. Only one I've ever seen the hands are right. Look at that. Covered in feathers. Then, oh my. It got really crazy. I saw this one at a Hobby Lobby. Had to get it. Same dinosaur. You should be able to tell from a distance. That is not right. Look at what they did to the hands. Look how they did to it walking. Then, I couldn't believe it, the original one, come back full circle, 
Now they put feathers all over it, paint it so it looked like it. They're not ashamed of it now. They put it right out there for you. Here's the funny thing about it. These are the ones they have put everything into turning into birds. Theropods have which kind of hips? Of all the dinosaurs they could have picked, which one did they pick? The ones with lizard hips. Not even any of the ones with bird hips, the one with lizard hips. It's as if the Lord knew someday, right? Not to mention, what's the problem with this? Birds created what number day in history? Five. Dinosaurs. See the problem? What you automatically have to do is you automatically have a major worldview conflict. If you're going to accept all this gobbledygook, it's pitiful. And then they talk about whether they're warm-blooded or cold-blooded. You go to the Chicago Field Museum. You walk in there. It says, what's a dinosaur? Dinosaur is a reptile. Yeah, woohoo! that's great. All right, we got it good. You walk around the corner. It says, birds are dinosaurs. What? What does that mean they're teaching birds are then? Are dinosaurs and reptiles? What? No, they wouldn't seriously teach that, would they? The all-knowing Wikipedia is citing the academic sources for where it got this. Teaches now, because this is what's being taught at university level, crocodiles are more closely related to birds than they are to lizards. And so birds are now classified as part of reptilia. You go to birds. Look at what it says. The fossil record indicates that birds evolved from earlier feathered dinosaurs from the which group? Lizard-hipped ones. Theropod group, which are traditionally placed when the stories can diners. Their closest living relatives are to crocodilians. So when you see a dromaeosaur there, you're supposed to think more penguin than gator. I guess they're both in the water, you know, but, you know, you got to go with the penguin one instead. Have you ever heard somebody say, you got to check your brain at the door to be a Christian? Seriously? Wow. This is a diagram. Posted in uh, Scientific American. So you got your crocodilians there, and then you got your theropods, because they have the same style hip, remember? And, and they do stuff to them to try to make them bird like. And then you got your theropods, and then you have modern birds. Oh, and by the way, it was put together by a guy named Jack Horner. That's how they evolved into birds. You got National Geographic, PBS. They show diagrams like this the progression of the dinosaurs evolving into birds. Funny thing, birds are found way down deep in the fossil record. So according to their dating methods, that would mean what? Which came first, birds or dinosaurs? Birds. In fact, look at the evolutionary dates they put on these. I went to a couple different evolutionary websites, like the Museum from London, a couple of uh, big academic sites, put their dates of how old they say these dinosaurs and birds are, and put it on National Geographic's thing. Dr. Charles Jackson also did this. And look, the 122 million year old gave birth to the 74 million year old, which gave rise to the 94 million year old. And then the 125 million, the 122, the 147, the oldest one on there, older than all the other dinosaurs, and then present day. Did they not think to go look, check? Did they think nobody else would? I mean, how did, you know when you tell a lie, and then you got to tell another lie, and then you got to tell a, and then what happens? Oh, I forgot that first lie I told. We now call them non-avian dinosaurs and avian dinosaurs. So the non-avian dinosaurs are the big clunky ones that went extinct. Avian dinosaurs are our modern birds. So we don't have to make a dinosaur. So I already have them. I know, you're, you're, as, you're as bad as the sixth graders, right? <laughs> the sixth graders look at it and they say, no. <laughs> you can call it, you can call it a dinosaur, but look at the velociraptor. The velociraptor is cool. 
The chicken is not. So this is our problem, as you can imagine. The chicken is a dinosaur. I mean, it really is. I mean, you, you can't argue with it because we, you know, we're the classifiers and we've classified it that way. So shut up and follow the science. That is nothing new within this debate. That's how this has worked for, for ages. So you get pictures like this. As a baby T-Rex by the American Museum of Natural History, which really dictates a lot of this stuff. They're kind of at the, the bully pulpit of paleontology. And, of course, none of that's true. But just so you know, there are secular, evolutionary worldview guys who have been in this for a long time and are like, I'm sorry, but you all are crazy. You are out to lunch if you think these things evolved into birds. These guys are prof the, that's their specialty, and they're like, there's no way. Now, they believe in evolution, they believe dinosaurs evolved, they believe birds evolved, but that theropods evolved into, they're like, there's no way. My, one of my favorite, I'll talk about Dr. Alan Fiducia, I've got his latest book he just put out in 2020, he said, have you ever heard anything described by what it's not? Avian dinosaurs and non-avian dinosaurs, non-bird dinosaurs. That's like saying non-mammalian salamanders. That's like saying non-reptilian elephants. Where anywhere in, in science do you do that? This is it. This is the only place. So just to let you know, they're not, they're, not everybody's bought into this. And here's why. Because the science is overwhelming. You put bird-like muscle structure on a T-Rex, he will fall down on his face. He cannot walk. You put crocodilian, reptilian-like muscle structure on it. He can pivot. He can move. He's actually pretty good on his feet. Well, why would we be surprised by that? You look at their brain shapes. Mammals, birds, reptiles have completely different brain shapes. Oh, wait a minute. What do we have here? We've got Stan the T-Rex. Guess what we can do? We can scan it and see what the brain case would look like, what the brain cavity would reveal to us, and this is what it is. There it is. There's a T-Rex brain. And by the way, just so you know, it's smaller than his tooth. I don't know if the other dinosaurs made fun of Stan or not, but they better not get too close. He'll bite them. So which one does that look like? Remember that whole warm-blooded, cold-blooded? According to everything they can tan, they can tell. Their thermal regulation, they have these two extra fenestra on the tops, just like crocodilians, just like other reptiles. They would regulate. Now, they did not take an actual thermal scan of a T-Rex. <laughs> Matt's like, where did we get a thermal scan of a T-Rex? I'm like, okay, I'll explain it. I'm sorry. I didn't. Uh, but they're just trying to illustrate what it would look like. It doesn't work. Um, Completely different lung structures. Bird lung structure, completely different from reptilian. From everything they can tell, from what's been preserved in the fossil record, reptilian type lung structure. In fact, if you try to take the air sacs that birds have and, and have to have in order to do what birds do, and you stick it in a theropod, it will crush the air sacs and it will suffocate. 2009 Oregon State University study. Is there anything that supports? There's one thing in there. Feathers. That's, their, that's their, their number, feathers. I had a gentleman this morning tell me about a special on Nova where they had the dinosaurs with all these feathers in Alaska so they'd stay warm. Last summer in Barnsdall, Oklahoma, I had a young person come up to me. I just talked about how there's no such thing as feathers on dinosaurs. He's like, but, but the Nanooksaurus! The what? The Nanooksaurus. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know every species of dinosaur. What, what, which one's the Nanooksaurus? He said the Nanooksaurus. They found in Alaska, it had a double layer of down for keeping warm in the winter, in the climates of Alaska. I said, well, let's go check it out. Because I had a hunch. When you know how this works behind the scenes with paleontology, 
what they actually discover and then what they portray in the media. So the Nenuxaurus, discovered in 2017, I believe it was, double layer down, here's all they found. That piece of the jaw. And guess what was not there? Double layered, and there were no feathers. He, he still, after he left VBS, he still was not, uh, oh, they wouldn't have just made that up, would they? See, he doesn't know what's really going on. Now, this is a spiritual worldview battle. So, the, the depictions just keep going. This was a National Geographic one of a T-Rex one time. I'm like, that looks like a muskrat that got too close to a nuclear plant. I don't know what that's supposed to be. I don't know. This one over here used to be on, um, on Wikipedia. They took it off because of how bad it was. Because guess what the science shows they were covered in? National Geographic. Covered in flat scales like those on modern crocodiles. Body-wide, crocodilian-like skin. So every time you see one of these, so this is, this is their updated version. They stick it on the end of the tail. Because, you know, you just put feathers out there and it's fine. And put a little on his head because we haven't found any scales there. Notice anywhere they haven't found scales, that's not where they try to stick the feathers. Have we found any feathers? No, we found scales every time. You read the headlines. Oh, look, world's only fossil of T-Rex skin. Suggests it's covered in scales, not feathers. Oh, look, Tyrannosaurus rex had scaly skin. Was it covered in feathers? Why is that even mentioned? In the headlines, every time you hear the disappointment, no feathers. It's so sad. So, don't lose hope, though. Here's how we reconcile that. Pattern among the Tyrannosaur kin, they all, all the different versions of Tyrannosaurus. So, the Albertosaurus, the... Tyrannosaurus, the Utyrannosaurus, I mean, you just name them all. They all, how many of them? All had skin, texture, small pebbly scales, and not fuzzy plumage. Multiple patches, multiple places, pretty clear. Body wide, remember we saw? But that may be, come on, we're, that may be the exception. We have plenty of evidence that early Tyrannosaurus had feathers. Where? Down in their heart. I'm not making that up. You read Ephesians chapter 4. It's not a battle of this. It's a battle of this. Every time. So maybe we just don't know how they're... So this... Yeah, the evolution of feathers is more complex than we previously thought. That must be why we're not finding it. This is Utyrannus. They say, oh, we got all these feathers on her. Well, they show these little patterns of little things being strewn out from the, uh, from the, uh, from the bones. And it's like, there, those are our feathers, those are our feathers. They don't look anything like real feathers in the fossil record, but that's okay. The best they ever got was in 2016, they got a piece of amber that had a little tail in it, 3.6 centimeters long, that did have feathers on it. 3.6 centimeters long. And it said it was adult feathers. I pulled up the scientific paper on it, the actual peer review paper in current biology, read the description. The IPV 15103 indeed presents, represents a juvenile saluosaur tail. The feathers most likely characterize adult plumage, though. However, there is some room for uncertainty. The pinaceous feathers and barbels look like the feathers on comparable to the conjured modern bird. It actually just looked like a modern-day bird. But it's being put out there that, no, it's a dinosaur tail with feathers. That's it. That's the best they got. Dr. Fiducia, I mentioned him just a second ago. He did some amazing work on this, and this is it. We're done after this. And uh, he said, so these integumentary fibers that you guys are saying on dinosaurs, like Cynosauriopteryx, phenomenal. See, there's this fuzzy stuff on there. Okay. There's a, there it is. There it is. There's the feathers. Got feathers. He looked at that, and he said, okay, that's pretty cool. He's like, I found some, too. Here they are. They're like, whoa. Dr. Fiducia, you're going to come over to our side now? You found feathers on dinosaurs? He said, I sure did. Pretty cool. They're like, well, what did you find them on? He said, I found them on an ichthyosaurus. And they're like, oh, what? See, uh, this right here is an ichthyosaurus. 
What kind of mode of transportation does it use? Flippers. Guess where it lives? It's a marine reptile lives in the water. What does a marine reptile need feathers for? That was not a good day for the bird watchers because it was the same stuff. What he found out in lab science, and several others have done this, both secular guys and creationists have recreated this. Um, what happened was when these things got buried very rapidly by some ca catastrophic event, tomorrow night, you don't want to miss, the muscle tissues, the skin tissues, all that fibrous material began to disintegrate and be strewn out, and then the rock solidified and solidified that pattern there. And it's all soft tissue that was being eroded away off the bones. None of it was feathers. He's gone on to show this on the ichthyosaurs, on the heterodontuses. Those are non-lizard hip. That was a problem. The cetacosaurus, cousin to triceratops. The therizinosaurus, the big, long Edward Scissorhand dinosaur. They're really weird. Rampharynchus, flying reptiles, and on dolphins. How many feathers do dolphins have? Zero. But he points out, every time they see this, though, they think feathers purely because of their worldview. And he's shown, and so many others, over and over and over again, none of it's true. So, I ask you tonight, do you believe in feather tales? All of this, it, you're like, that, that was fun, but why, why spend it? I'm telling you, this has become, in our travels all across the country, this has become the number one issue about dinosaurs with young people. They had feathers. They evolved, therefore, into birds. And therefore, this book has no clue what it's talking about. When it comes to dinosaurs, when it comes to evolution, when it comes to where you came from. And so they grew up hearing all these nice little Bible stories at church, but then they go to the university where real science is taught. And so apparently this book isn't true. Did any of the actual real lab type science ever disprove one word of this book and what we've seen tonight? No, what did it disprove? Everything you've seen in the secular media. This is a spiritual battle. It's a spiritual battle. And that's why we do this. It's not because we want to win scientific debates. It has nothing to do with that. Because you can take all the stuff we're going to talk about each and every night and go out there into the world and say, oh, look at all this science, look at this science, 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 science. It's not going to convert a single person. You know what's going to convert somebody? Life. And you being there in those moments of life, living like no one else lives, you love that person. You go out of your way to help that person. You're there to serve them and support them and be there. And you do that for like anybody. What is it about you? Well, there's this guy named Jesus. He changed my life. He changed your life. And now, who are they going to go to when they've got questions? And you'll have answers. Are you ready to go win some hearts? Not mine's hearts. Father, thank you that someone told us about the love of Jesus.